Good morning. I want to call to order the September 10th special call meeting of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, I first want to thank my fellow commissioners for their attendance this morning on such short notification. We've got some important things, of course, to discuss today. And I also want to recognize and thank uh, uh, Dr. Flynn, uh, Dr. Katie Flynn, uh, who is the state veterinarian for her presence with us today, as well as Dr. Chrissy Casey, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, veterinarian. Both of them are here with us today, as well as cabinet officials. Thank you for coming on such short notice. So um, we appreciate everybody being here. I want the record to show that seven commission members are present today. Of course, the sixth is still on field and uh, uh, Commissioner Brian Fisher was unable to be with us today. He is out of the state and was unable to be here. But thank you other six commissioners for being here and taking time out of your day for this important meeting today. I want to remind everybody before we get started, please silence your phones and make sure that your microphones are all functional. And as you can see everybody, I can see everybody now, but I want to make sure all of you can. If you cannot, please let us know right away. I can't. Um, I can't see everybody. Okay, let's see if we can. I, I can see you. So. I can see you, Dr. Floyd. Lucky you. Hello, I see you too. Good morning. Reverend, Reverend okay. Morgan, you look good. Okay, so you can see everybody now? Oh, no, it's a blank screen. It only says KDFWR. Is that, is that right? Is that what everybody no, You should be able to see everybody on the screen. So I, I don't know if it's on your end. IT is going to look at it here. I don't know if it's on your end or on our end. but I, seen, see. I seem to be able to see people better now. Dr. Floyd, it should be in your view, um, uh -huh. top right corner, if you go to view and select gallery instead of speaker, you should be able to see everybody. That worked. Perfect. Okay, good. Uh, before we get going into the, to the discussion items today, uh, Commissioner Storm is going to bring our invocation and his two daughters, Avery and Phoebe, have stopped by the office for a few minutes, and they have agreed to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, uh, Commissioner Storm, I'll turn it over to you for the invocation, sir. Please uh, bow your head with me. Father God in heaven, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every day that we have here on earth. We uh, praise you for so many things, and we thank you for the state that we live in and the resources that we have. And we know that your, bless, your blessings of these resources give us the opportunity to have them. And Lord, we ask you to be with us today. Give us wisdom and strength to make decisions that would honor and please you. Which in your son's Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Avery and Phoebe, we're going to stand. And if you all will face the flag, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, girls? <laughs> Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies. That's real kind of you to do for us today. Now I guess you can go about going wherever you're going to go. So thank you, girls, for doing that today. As most of you have heard now after the postings online, um, the state of Tennessee notified the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Commissioner that they had had a reported and double verified case of chronic wasting disease found about 15 miles from Murray, Kentucky, about eight miles from the Kentucky border. Part of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources chronic wasting disease response plan planned on anything that close that would, would kick into the process of, of following the directives of the response plan to go into service. So today we're going to get a, a, an update from uh, what's happening in Tennessee, as well as the discussion of the plan that was implemented about two years ago by the commission after months of months of perusal by the AFWA Association and by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. As most of you know, they, they have gone through a, a lot of trouble and, and detail to, to get this program together. I would suggest to shareholders who may be watching today, if you go to the homepage of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife and up there in the search block, type in the chronic wasting disease response plan, 
you will see a 13 page summary of what the plan entails. And it would be great if you wanna peruse that and follow along and between now and next week when we entertain questions from the public, you'll be able to get educated on what that response plan is. So uh, before we start those, I'm gonna ask uh, the commissioner if he wanna make some remarks and, and do a kind of a background of where we're gonna to start today's discussion. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank Tennessee for reaching out to us and giving us ample opportunity to uh, prepare for this and their expedited approach has helped us. And, and I'm gonna tell you immediately, we started an emergency response team and uh, we have been going all day long ever since. As you know, while we're here today because of chronic wasting disease, and now our response plan has been activated and these emergency actions, which we'll talk about in this meeting today will be in place. But I wanna to emphasize today, we don't have a good team. We have a great team. We have a strong team. We have people that I have a lot of confidence in. And, and I think you're gonna find what we've done so far to be uh, pleasing. I think you're gonna find that there has been a gr great deal of research and effort that's been put into this. We've had this plan in place for nearly 20 years and it has evolved through time and we expected this day would come. Though we have not detected in the state of Kentucky, it is, it's very close. And so we're gonna ramp up these efforts. First step that we put in place, myself and our wildlife director, Chris Garland, we decided to announce that Gabe Jenkins would be the coordinator of this program. Gabe has a career of, um, activity with this agency and he is uh he has he is focused on, on chronic wasting disease he's qualified he's competent um gabe has gone over to the information and education division and this is not just a wildlife issue this is an education this is an information campaign this is a law enforcement campaign this is our agency uh, unified and so we're going to have a unified effort here uh, again, a special thanks today for Dr. Uh, Casey to be here and our state vet, Dr. Flynn. And I wanna thank our license holders and all of our supporters out there for what you do because uh, without you, we couldn't do what we do. But at this time, I'm, I'm gonna turn uh, this presentation over to Gabe Jenkins. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Storm. Thank you for the opportunity to work with you all and work uh, with you guys and update you this morning on kind of where we've been. Um, I have a short presentation that I would like to show just kind of get everybody up to speed on, you know, the, the CWD plan and then all the way into the here and now. Um, first, I will say that I would like this to be interactive. So as I go along, if you have questions or, or thoughts you want to uh, address, please just speak up. Um, also with us, I know we, we've referred to them a couple of times, but we have to uh, Dr. Katie Flynn from the Department of Ag, our own state veterinarian, Dr. Casey, Chris Garland, John Hast, and Kyle Sam. So everybody who within the agency has worked on chronic waste and disease and spent a lot of time and effort there are all with us today and uh, are a great resource and we'll be calling on them a lot here. So to get in, I'm going to share my screen real quick here and we'll get going. While you're doing that, do you mind if I mention... Uh our public comments real quick. Go right ahead, Brian. Uh, so we will be, or the commission will be receiving public comments from now until 5 p.m. next Tuesday on this topic. So if anyone has any questions, uh, we have lots of information on our website. We'll be happy to pinpoint that for anyone. Uh, and then also the, the commission welcomes uh, comments on this topic as you'll be hearing updates today. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Brian. So chronic waste and disease, this is our chronic waste and disease plan. Um, what I would like to do is just kind of give you a high level review of the plan, uh, what it looks like, what's in it, what our responses are, and then bring us into the today and here and now. So the first draft was written, written in 2002 when uh, CWD was detected the first time in the Eastern US and Wisconsin. 
Um, through that 19 year period, this, this plan has been an adaptive plan that changes based upon new science and research. Um, you know, initially it was a plan that we wrote and through time we have collaborated with our partners with the Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Veterinary Services. We also incorporate recommendations that were provided by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies or AFWA and a document they created that was called the Best Management Practices for Chronic Wasting Disease. The commission and the public have been regularly updated on CWD and have endorsed our plan. In 2019, the commission voted that we formally adopt the AFWA CWB MPs as a CWD management guide for the agency and forward. Also in 2019, we launched a, a very aggressive campaign on chronic wasting disease, what it was, what it looked like. And we hosted a series of, of public meetings all across the state. We produced a handful of educational videos and seminars that we put out on all of our social media channels to inform the public of the disease or our plan and what we would do if we were to detect chronic wasting disease in Kentucky. So diving into the plan, the first part of the plan touches on prevention of chronic wasting disease and by introduction. So measures that we would do and try to implore to prevent the, the introduction of the disease. The second part of it is early detection and management of the disease in Kentucky and try to infect in the infected areas. Our hopes is that we can eliminate CWD where possible and then use that scientific evidence to, to uh, figure out where the disease is. And ultimately we will monitor for its prevalence, the distribution of the disease, and then the spread of the disease as it spreads across the landscape. So in this plan, the, the first part is really heavy on prevention and early detection. Part of prevention is also a strong communication effort. So this summer we ran a, a deer hunter survey and we asked the question, what do you know about chronic wasting disease or have you ever heard of it? And so based upon our survey results this summer, 56% of our Kentuckians said they were somewhat familiar with chronic waste and disease. So about half of our folks knew what the disease was and a little bit about it. However, that was a little bit uh, concerning is what was your concern about chronic waste and disease? They were only 57% uh, were somewhat concerned. So to us as managers, it, it is a big deal and it is concerning. So we, it showed us we had some more effort to do in the communication of what CWD looked like and its impacts through our deer and elk herds. For us as an agency, we, we have a very scientific rigorous uh, sampling strategy where we involve lots of different metrics to go into it to try to help us collect samples in a very financially uh, smart way, but also strategically where we think uh, we might find the disease. It's based upon risk. Uh, multiple factors go into this risk um, based upon the number of wild deer that are in a county, the number of captive servant facilities, the number of movements of those facilities, the proximity to other CWD positive areas in our bordering states, um, and other factors that we deem as risky uh, that we think um, could increase your risk of introducing CWD. And this model we have used since 2018 to help us determine how many samples we need to collect at the county level to be comfortable with our surveillance that we're doing a, a good job at monitoring our population. The first part that we use in our surveillance is targeted surveillance. And this is directly trying to get animals that appear or act sick. So you'll hear us talk about if you see a sick animal or found a recently dead deer, please call us. That is, is one of our like highest risk animals that we have on the landscape and we implore our hunters and our landowners to let us know. When we get that information, we, we try to deploy somebody to go collect that animal and test that. So this is, these are very high risk animals. We try to do our very best to get them. The second part and where we spend the bulk of our effort is in the active surveillance. And this is collecting samples from animals that appear healthy, whether that's through hunter harvested deer or elk or deer that were hit on the road. This is where, like I said, the bulk of our samples come from, and this is the traditional way that all state fish and wildlife agencies collect the majority of, of their samples through this active surveillance. And this is done by our agency folks and, the, and our partners. 
Also with this active surveillance is something new that we launched last year, working with the public that we're calling the deer sample collection stations. We have deployed about 15 to 20 freezers all across the state and directions. So if our hunters would like to have their deer tested, they can simply come to one of those locations. There's directions on how to, to uh, record the sample, stick that in our freezer, and then we will go and get that tested. It's a free service that we offer and it's very popular and we're really proud of this effort. And we've, this, this presentation is, is not up to date. We've added a, a many more since, and uh, it's a great way for us to interact with our, with our partners. If you're interested in doing something like this, you can find this information on our website by searching deer sample collection stations or go to our CWD page and find the most recent update of where all those locations are across the state. So since 2002, uh, we have collected a little more than 32,000 samples. The majority of those have been whitetailed, but some have been elk. Just kind of a breakdown of how many uh, across the state over these last 19 years and where they've come from. So uh, looking at that, it's a broad geographic range, but we are and have collected samples in every county, a, a number of samples in every county uh, through this period. So if we were to, to detect CWD or close by, what would our initial steps be? If we received a positive test result after it was confirmed, these are the following actions that we would employ. And you have seen many of these efforts already. So we would contact our rel relevant constituents, partner and agencies, and, and then inform them of what has happened within 24 to 48 hours. We would then establish a chronic waste and disease response team and begin to implement our incident command system and implement our chronic waste and disease plan. And then finally, right, you know, all of these happen very quickly. We would consider and implement emergency legislation and or regulations if necessary. So why we are essentially here today. Our response plan really covers three different scenarios for us. Whether you are a wild or free ranging cervid or deer and elk, if you are a captive deer or an elk, or if we detect the disease within 30 miles of our border. If we found it, find it in a free ranging deer, for us, we know it's in Kentucky at this point, we need to determine its prevalence and how spread across the landscape is it. At that point, we would create two zones, a CWD management zone and a CWD surveillance zone for us to intensively sample in those areas to, to determine the prevalence and the spread of the disease. We would also do a deer, a deer density estimate to figure out exactly how many deer we anticipate that are on the, the landscape to supplement our deer population models to see what the density looks like at that time. We would also still continue to collect hunter harvested, roadkill, and, and deer removal in those two zones. We would implement a baiting and feeding ban uh, of all deer and elk in the surveillance zone. We would restrict deer carcass movement. We would prohibit the re rehabilitation release of, of, of deer um, in those areas. And then if we were to find additional positives, we would expand those surveillance zones and management zones uh, as we find the disease more across the landscape. For us, the key, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning, the plan is very adaptive. It really is a guide for us on the initial response and then as we learn and as we move forward, we will have to change and modify based upon what we find on the landscape. Secondly, and this really doesn't apply today, but this is addressed in our plan. If a captive deer or an elk was positive, and you know, this falls under the Department of Agriculture, but we also work with them and co-regulate this entity and why we have uh, Dr. Flynn with us today. And these are some of the efforts that they would do you know, they would quarantine, the state veterinarian would quarantine the facility. There would be discussions about depopulation of that facility. And then we would modify or potentially augment the fencing around those facilities. And then at that point, Department of Agriculture might put out emergency regulations. We would work cooperatively together. And then we would also provide it or establish a smaller buffer around that captive facility to do the exact same things that we mentioned in, in the first case to see if it's in the wild and, and determine its prevalence across the state. 
And then thirdly, if a chronic waste and disease positive animal is detected within 30 miles of our border, um, there are a couple different things that we would enact. Um, we would increase our CWD surveillance effort um, around those counties. Uh, if it's within 30 miles, we would increase our communication with the public and um, establish a surveillance zone at, at the 30 mile distance. If it's within 15 miles, it's even closer at this point. And we would establish a surveillance zone and we would essentially enact our response plan like we have found the disease in Kentucky. So at this point, you know, we, we've covered a little bit of that, but our chronic waste and disease plan has been enacted based upon the results that we heard from Tennessee today. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick update on what we know. We've covered this a little bit um, with Tennessee, but Tennessee detected a three and a half year old adult doe uh, that was positive for chronic waste and disease in Henry County. The deer was exhibit, exhibiting symptoms consistent with chronic waste and disease. So, you know, it was late stage with the disease. It was exactly 7.8 miles south of our Kentucky border in Callaway County, the close, closest large town being Murray. And just as a reminder, when we detect a positive within 15 miles, our plan is enacted like we found the disease in the state. So just a map of Tennessee and what this looks like. So the CWD core zone in Tennessee is down just west of Memphis there in Fayette and Hardeman County. And you can see in, in that map, and then they detected this deer. If you look on there in Northwest, about 40 to 50 miles Northwest of their CWD endemic zone. So it made a large jump uh, or spark that we kind of refer to it as uh, right there along our border. As much as we would like to build a wall between us and Tennessee to prevent any of us movement, we realize this is not possible. So for us, it will be a strong effort with us and the volunteer state to collectively work together on disease efforts and, and monitoring. So we will collaborate with TWRA. We already have in the last few hours from multiple different levels from the commissioner's office down to the biologist to share information to get an education from what they're doing, what their plans are, and work collectively to get together on this effort. What Tennessee has informed us so far is they have established the, a surveillance zone in Henry and Weekly County. They have already enacted carcass exportation restrictions, meaning they are not allowed, they are not allowing a deer harvested in any of those counties to leave those two counties. They've enacted a feeding and baiting ban they will be increasing testing, and then they plan to discuss this further at a wildlife commission meeting next week to address, to address any additional regulations. And with that, I'll take any questions on the plan and Tennessee's uh, response to the best that I can. Gentlemen, the floor is open for any questions that you have. I know you may have some comments that you'd like to make too, but for, for the first part, if we can, let's, Let's reserve it since we've got him here in front of you uh, with the microphone and camera. Let's try to reserve this for questions about CWD. Um, I, I, somebody called me this morning with the, how long does it take for symptoms to begin to show in the animals? And uh, I, I, I'll turn that over to you, Gabe, if you want to yeah, so address that. About a year and a half from the time they're exposed to where they're exhibiting symptoms that you and I could tell that they might have the disease. Thank you. Gentlemen. Gabe, um, do we know how much more sampling Tennessee's doing there in Henry County now? Not at this time. Um, they've not given us a number they, that we know they'll be increasing it, but it's to be decided at this point. Have they already enacted their baiting ban? Yes. So what I provided just a second ago, those are things that went into effect and it, it immediately once they detected the disease and then they will need commission action to do anything further than than what i uh, showed there do go, go ahead paul right. go ahead brian finish finish your comment brian um uh, is, is tennessee using an in-state facility for their test samples or are they sending them out of state so they, they do a little bit of both and dr casey might chip in here as well so they have a 
a state lab that will test the samples. And then they have a, the national vet lab in um, Ames, Iowa will also confirm uh, if they need to. But in many of these cases, uh, after second and third tests within the state, they're positive. Um, so it depends on where it is and, and what, the, what the animal looks like. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Gabe and their baiting ban, is it just in the two new counties where it was detected or is it in the corridor from where the larger population of CWD in the past was all the way to the two counties? No, it's just in those two counties. So they did the exact same thing we did. They put a dot on the map, put circles around it, and wherever those circles fall, if they fell into a county, that became their surveillance zone. And so when they established that area, it encompassed two, two counties. Do they use the same radius that we do, 30 mile radius? Or? Not sure off the top of my head. Can I, can I provide some updates from Tennessee if I can? Go ahead, Dr. Casey. So I'm, I'm in touch with their state wildlife veterinarian, Daniel Grove. Um, and so essentially I, I do have some updates in terms of numbers of what they are looking for in that area. Um, they're, they're going between the two counties. Um, so basically it's gonna, they're looking for about six, 600 samples. Um, that's animals. And that's, we both, both states, both Tennessee and Kentucky use a weighted system. And so that depends on the sample that you get. So if you get an adult, um, male, you'll get three points. So that's two and a half year old buck will be worth three points versus anything between one and two is one point. Um, and so those points are important because weighted surveillances are based on the number of points. So they're shooting for a thousand points in Henry County and then 800 points in Weekly County. Um, and basically that, I mean, the number of animals depends, but if it was all adult males, it would be 600 animals. And then in regards to, if you have any more questions about testing, it, it just depends their in-state lab uses the ELISA and then they send it out to the national laboratory for the IHC, which is the gold standard confirmation test. Other questions at this point for Gabe? Gabe, are you gonna discuss all these? In I will in a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. One thing that I would like to do if, if Dr. Flynn is with us, um, to put her on the spot is just to share uh, what the Department of Agriculture is gonna do and has done already. I mean, we'll say they're a great partner with us. We've met with them and discussed with them uh, a lot the last couple of days. And uh, since we worked with them, I figured to give her the floor to, to speak and, and talk about the captive side of things. Dr. Flynn, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all today. On behalf of the commissioner and the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, we appreciate the staff assistance and collaboration and cooperation in this partnership for preventing and controlling CWD. I just wanna give everybody a kind of an overview of our uh, program really quickly. All farm servants within the state of Kentucky fall under our authority and they're all permitted facilities under our regulations. That does require them to have official identification as well as a surveillance program. Part of that is all servants over 12 months of age must go through that have died or harvested must be sampled. So they're all required to be sampled over 12 months of age that are die or are harvested. And then all movements from these facilities are all permitted movements. And that permitted re movements require the certificate of veterinary inspection and our folks are verifying the movements of these herds. In addition, we do annual physical inventories of these herds as well as quarterly inspections on these herds um, by our field staff. So just in general, what we've done, we do have uh, a few facilities within this area of the five county area. We have reached out to them regarding the situation and just gave them some information as far as uh, clinical signs and making them aware of what they're checking for clinical signs. We've been in communication with their herd veterinarians so that they're aware that if they are contacted, um, they, mu they must go and uh, uh, visit that herd our field staff are doing site visits to do additional observation of clinical signs in these uh, specific herds that are in these five county areas. We've also been in touch with the um, Kayla Association and we've 
put out an alert this morning for all of our producers. We're putting it in the mail and posting it on our website of the situation and just bringing awareness to what clinical signs they should be on the lookout for. And I just wanna make one comment as far as if there was a detection in our captive servant herds, our farm servant uh, plan would be in accordance to USDA and USDA would provide the indemnity funding. So depopulation would be dependent upon USDA providing that uh, funding to us. Um, otherwise, if there is no funding, they would be under a quarantine program with us and a herd plan. So I just wanted to make that uh, comment that we don't automatically, we can't automatically depopulate a positive herd. We have to work with USDA. And I'm open to any questions. I believe I just hit a couple of the high points. Questions for Dr. Flynn or Dr. Casey, gentlemen? Yes, sir, Brian, Mackey. Brian, you're we on mute. We, we, can't, we can't hear you, sir. How many um, facilities do we have in the surveillance zone right now? In the five county area, we have five herds that are under our program. I have, a, I have a map here that I'll show at some point that depicts the, the zone and the map or and the captive facilities. Mr. Horn? Do we know if Tennessee has any uh, captive facilities? If so, how many and how close to the newest detection spot? I don't have that information. I don't know if Dr. Casey has. I have a call. So I'm going to call Tennessee here shortly. So they Tennessee does not allow captive deer or elk, but they do have... Uh, other servants that they have in a pen. Um, so we're not talking about captive pen deer, pen elk uh, in Tennessee. Further questions, gentlemen, at this point? Uh, Brian Mackey. Um, doc, this go to Gabe or Dr. Casey. Do we know how much testing Tennessee had been doing in Henry County until this one popped up? Not specifically Henry County, but Henry and Weekly County. In their report that they gave, they've tested about 800 deer and those two counties combined um, over the last decade and a half, couple decades. Yeah, so their, their points went up pretty significantly. Um, I had it down on a piece of paper. Oh, let's see, I wanna say, um, so previously, um, it was about 91 points, and then the other one was 64 points. Um, so essentially what happens is with these points, they have their core um, endemic CWD area where there's the higher amount of points. And then the rest of the state, they allocate 3,000 points across it um, based on those risk factors. And so, you know, it's, it's very similar to ours where we allocate 4,000 points across the state. Um, Before uh, we move, uh, I'll give uh, Chris Garland a chance to talk. If he has anything he'd like to, to update on or, or mention since he's, this falls under the wildlife division as well. Thank you, Gabe. I would, uh, I would just update our freezer locations. We do have 18 locations out currently um, with our updated numbers. Um, we have one in every county in the surveillance zone and hope to improve that. And there's another one just north of that in McCracken County. Um, we've, been, we've been talking to staff and, and getting ready to roll to collect samples. And I think currently underway to collect as many samples as we can, you know, with road kills and, and with processors and taxidermists. So we're all, already working on it. So be before we jump right into the agenda, I just want to highlight a few additional things. Um, you've seen a, a pretty strong communication effort from the agency. Um, you know, in our incident command, we have a communication section where we have a variety of staff working on getting the word out to the folks in Kentucky and our hunters in Kentucky of what's going on. Um, you saw the, the video with Commissioner Storm. We put out a, an email that went to uh, four or 500,000 uh, licensed buyers. We've made posts on all of our social media channels. Um, we'll do an additional post this weekend about our freezer collection stations to inform anybody if they want to donate a deer to be tested. So we, we have a, a very aggressive communications plan and communications effort over the coming weeks. Uh, but you will see a lot from the agency just trying to keep everybody up to date and in the loop on, on our efforts within, within the state. Mr. Chairman. Go, go ahead, Mr. Clark. 
I just want to thank Dr. Flynn for joining us and for your the partnership of ag, especially in the last uh, couple of years. You guys have really stepped up and and uh, worked with us a lot. We just really appreciate it. Um, also, Gabe, just for clarity to the zone, uh, uh, the folks that are in those counties, you mentioned uh, a map. You may may have planned at a different time to show that, but I was just going to ask at some point if you didn't already plan to call it out, if you would show that map, we could highlight those counties. And then also, again, reiterate, I know you covered it earlier in the, in the response, but reiterate the specific uh, provisions of the plan that apply to those folks. So, you know, stakeholders who are watching here and then view this uh, subsequently will get that. And as you mentioned uh, aptly, uh, we are communicating directly as, as much uh, broadcasting, but also directly to our licensed buyers who have deer privileges, deer hunting privileges, to get the word out to them about these uh, provisions that apply to those counties. So my plan was to really dive into all of our requests next, but I wanted to, to give the commission and our viewers uh, an update on where we've been with the plan, what we've done and the kind of a status update on Tennessee and just Thank give you. everybody an opportunity to, to ask questions and uh, any, anything they'd like to comment about. Well, I, I think it's refreshing that we've got Dr. Casey and Dr. Flynn so willing to work together with each other, as well as Commissioner Storm and uh, uh, Ryan Quarles working together in agriculture. It, it's it's good that everybody's able to be on the same page with with fighting this problem. And uh, kudos to all of four of you all for being so willing to work with each other and uh, help out the sportsmen of Kentucky. Um, Anybody else have any comments at this point or questions, any additions to what's been presented at this point? I, I want to remind everybody that we have three new commission members who were not a, a, a party to this 2019 review and acceptance of this plan. So uh, I, I appreciate the fact that I know they have reviewed this. We're already familiar with the fact that we had this plan in existence, but they have reviewed this and uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm tickled that they're probably up to speed on all of these things. Yeah, I see Dr. Floyd holding his up. I, I, uh, I had a conversation with uh, with Mr. Mackey, and he was he said I, I, I've already looked it over and, and looked into it, so he's familiar with it. So and Josh too. So I, I appreciate you guys having to work hard to kind of catch up to speed in such short time. But but it is important that uh, everybody on the commission both understand where we are and that this has been in in the process for a number of years and reassure the public that uh, you all have this thing uh, well managed as far as a plan in action. So uh, much of this is this meeting today is for to reassure the public that we, 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 we have some kind of plan and, and we're going to implement that. So um, I appreciate all your all's efforts. So Chairman, you, yes, sir. I have, I have a comment. Go ahead, Mr. Morgan. Well, I'd just like to say that being involved through a lot of this, not all of it, but a, a good part of it. Uh, I'm just uh, grateful that we have a good plan in place and the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources can move forward in a competent and well thought out manner under the guidance of a really good commissioner. And I, I am uh, confident that we will do the best defense possible against this disease. I'm really confident of that. So that's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Anybody else before Gabe continues? Go ahead, Gabe. All right. So what I, at this point, what I'd like to do is share with you a map. Um, I attached this in the uh, uh, to you guys late last night, but for our, for our viewers and the public to see. Give me a second here. All right, so Southwest uh, Kentucky, uh, Callaway County, you, you look in the kind of the center bottom map uh, is Henry County. That's the, the positive detection, 7.8 miles to our Kentucky border in Callaway County. Uh, the closest major town, uh, Dr. Floyd, is uh, Murray there in Callaway. So literally right in his back door uh, of, of where the disease is located. That pink line that you see is our 30 mile buffer that we drew around 
uh, the, the positive in Tennessee, and then our plan calls for every every county that that lane and that line encompasses that it it become the surveillance zone. So at that point, um, it picks up five counties: Fulton, Hickman, Graves, Marshall, and Callaway. Um, we talked previously about captive servants. Uh, we have four facilities within this five county area and those are indicated there by the red dots. Um, also, this will encompass land between the lakes in Tennessee uh, to the west there that you can see in yellow. Um, also in the green is our public areas, so the, the dark green areas, the public areas that we uh, have or, or cooperate with uh, landowners uh, in, across, the, across that five counties. So uh, not a lot, but we do have a, a few public areas that this, this impacts. Any questions about the map uh, that, that you guys have and what that looks like? All right. G Gabe, this, this is Katie. If I can just make a comment because it might not be clear on the map, two, pre two premises are two dots on top of each other for our captive. So it may, it may appear as we only have four, um, but there are five. Yep, and, and just the it's difference in how we regulate, we, we count them as four because it's one facility with the Department of Ag, there, there are two different operations. So they count them as two, we count them as one, but we're, we're all aware of, of the facilities and where they are and what that looks like. So thank you for that clarification. No questions from there. I'll jump right into what we're proposing for our emergency actions. Um, I'm going to share my screen here again. Bear with me. So what, what we have done in the last couple, couple days is sit down, review our plan, look at the regulations that we have in place, and then what we say in the plan, we want to follow that and make those recommendations to, to you. Um, specifically of those regulations are deer hunting reg 301 KAR 2172. We would define the CWD surveillance zone as Fulton, Hickman, Graves, Marshall, and Callaway counties. We would prohibit the export of entire deer carcasses. Uh, you know, we're talking about the brains and spinal columns. We would allow at that point clean skull plates, um, Deboned meat, quarters of that stuff to uh, to be to leave the surveillance zone, but entire deer carcasses we would not. Um, let's see here, we allow the movement of legally harvested survey carcasses and parts within the surveillance zone, so they can move back and forth, but they cannot leave that surveillance zone. Um, we would enact a, a baiting and feeding ban in all five counties, and that would include anything that you put on the ground that is really ingested for deer, whether that's grain, salt, mineral, uh, all of those substances. We are also for, uh, recommending mandatory check of harvested deer in those five counties during the following four seasons. The youth only season, October 9th and 10th, the early muzzleloader season on October 16th and 17th, the 16-day 16 16 modern gun season, November 13th to the 28th. And then lastly, the nine-day December muzzleloader season, December 11th through the 19th. And Commissioner Kleiner, if it's okay, I'll just go through all of these sure. and then I'll open it up to questions. I, I, I will say, gentlemen, these are the amendments that the department proposes that will specify, since we have it in, in these five counties, that will specify what will be done there uh, and we not, are not voting on these today. They wanted to list them so that you all could peruse their, their request as well as the public be able to look at these and make comments between now and next week. And I'll remind everybody before we close the session today where they can do that. But they wanted to do this today so everybody could see it and kind of bench cure this and digest these things a little bit. But these are the specific amendments that they want to do in order to uh, address those specific areas in the state. Go ahead, sir. So I will say these are specifically outlined on the agenda. 
So for our viewers, if you want to look at these, we'll share them again and I'll, as I go through them, but this, they are listed on the, the agenda. So getting back to it, uh, the next regulation would be 301 KAR 2015. This is the feeding of wildlife regulation. Um, this is going to be the exact same that we proposed for 301 2172, the deer hunting reg, but we felt it needed to go into both. Um, prohibit baiting and feeding of all wildlife in the surveillance zone, you know, grain, salt, mineral, anything essentially that they, a deer would ingest. And then lastly, uh, the regulation of 301 KAR 2075, the wildlife rehabilitation permit. So these are the folks who rehab injured or orphan wildlife. We would prohibit the rehab of deer uh, within this five county zone and any deer that is currently being rehabbed must be released within the county in which the rehabilitation took place. Um, this is not listed on the map, but in that five counties, we have one deer or we have one rehabber uh, in that facility. And so it, this is not a, a huge impact to those folks, uh, but um, that's what we know on, on the rehab side. So at this point, that covers the, the regulations and what we're proposing uh, at this point uh, for those efforts, um, and we'll take any questions. Yes, Paul. Paul Horn. Gabe, on the mandatory check stations, uh, what do you envision that being? Is it going to be one uh, department-ran check facility in each of the five counties, or just kind of what are you, what are you thinking along those lines? Well, so like, you know, we're still working on the nuts and bolts of the plan. And, you know, we, we're kind of all being adaptive. We've really focused on getting the, this meeting, these things in place. We've had these initial discussions. We're probably looking at a couple and maybe even you know, three to four to five. Like Graves County is a really big county. And so we want to make this very easy for our hunters to find us and very easy and accessible locations. So we're going to be working with all, all of our partners all of our staff in those counties to try to find the best places, um, but we will have ample opportunities and ample places for our hunters to come and have those deer checked. But the exact number, uh, it's, it's unknown at this point. But it will be a department operated facility. Correct. <laughs> yep. Mr. Lillard. Thanks, Sean Clyard. Um, with the, uh, every deer, you know, being, have to be checked do, do you guys think that will be enough or will we need to look at more liberalized uh you know you can take more deer or potentially more hunts put in those areas to get enough um animals uh collected that we can test out great quick great question commissioner um for us we know on average there's about seven thousand deer harvested in those five counties annually um with with the proposed uh, requirements for physical check station during those during those seasons, we anticipate we'll we'll collect you know five thousand six thousand, which is ample amount for us to be confident that we've surveyed what we need to. So we feel that working with our hunters, providing these uh, restrictions or these um, uh, proposed check stations, that we will get the compliance we need to have, do a great job at uh, disease surveillance. With Dr. no impact to our hunters. Dr. Floyd, I, I, I will come back to you in a minute because I know you want to make comments about the taking of deer that Josh just mentioned. So I'll come back to you here in a few minutes after we kind of go through these three amendments, if you don't care, because I know you have a couple of comments about taking of deer. So Josh has kind of hit on that subject. So if you don't care, we'll put that off until we answer uh, questions or, uh, to, to Gabe concerning these three amendments. Uh, if that's okay with you, but we'll come back to your comments that you wanted to make because I know you wanted to make some. Ralph, uh, would you go ahead and ask a question of Gabe? Under amending 301, um, under feeding of wildlife, you've got other ingested attractants there. Is that to include um, uh, deer lure, uh, estrus, that kind of thing? Uh, we're, pro we're proposing no. So any type of deer urine, synthetic or natural, we would still allow that. So, um, but what we're going for is like a pour on mineral that you would dump 
that's what we want to eliminate. But you know, nobody's dumping gallons of, of deer urine uh, right. on the landscape. So we tried to feel what was the biggest risk and and kind of compromise there. So deer urine we would still allow. Thank you for that point of clarification. That would make that uh, very plain uh, across the board. The other would be with the increased surveillance collection and everything, are we staffed? Are we able to meet the demand? Uh, what's gonna come on? Do we need to be thinking about um, an expansion? Uh, possibly if we find other cases, what kind of strain that'll put on the agency? So it, it will be all, all hands on deck. Um, you know, as you've already seen, you know, I'm, I'm in I &E and talking about the disease and working this, we're gonna call heavily on our, our law enforcement division um, you know, it's kind of commonplace for other state agencies when they detect it, that if, if you work for them, you go work a deer check station or help pull a CWD sample. So uh, it will be a, a large undertaking for us, and we're up to that task, and you know, we're committed to that. I know Commissioner Storm is, and you guys are as well, but we do have the staffing to, to do that. Um, in our incident command system that we've created, we have a, a section that will handle all of that staffing for these and we've already begun looking at numbers and what that looks like and how to deploy our staff all across the state. So, you know, I'll let Chris, if he wants to jump in on here with, you know, it'll be heavy wildlife division, but I anticipate everybody will have the opportunity within the agency to, to work on it. Ralph, I'm, I might add to Gabe's statement that I have talked to Colonel Gibson and uh, I think he has a couple of people with health issues, a couple of officers with health, health issues in those five counties, just maybe two, but he's already working on a plan to uh, to send more officers to that area to, to help both in education and compliance with some of those things. So I know he is working with the commissioner and with uh, Gabe to uh, see that that area is covered probably, I wouldn't call it maybe saturated, but maybe oversupplied with officers from other regions or, or, or the other districts to, to help out with the guys who are who are going to be out for health issues. So they're working on that kind of to Gabe's remark. They, they're all working and coordinating that effort together. I do know. Good, all Good right. question though. Other questions for Gabe about these amendments? Uh, Mr. Mackey? Do, uh, do we have the ability to maybe look at hiring some seasonal techs to help with some of this? I know you need trained staff pulling the samples, but when you start tagging and scanning and doing the record keeping and cutting heads off, you know, I, I understand the idea with, you know, bringing law enforcement in, but then we're kind of taking them away from their other jobs. And, you know, if we could use some DECA funding or um, seasonal technicians where we don't have to go through the lengthy you know, contract process of getting approval, I think maybe that might be something that we should possibly look at to, to help alleviate some strain on these guys that are going to be in the surveillance zone, you know, doing all this work because it's, there's going to be a lot of moving parts of this, this machine and we're going to find some things that work good, some that don't, you know, modify, change and and it's going to be an evolving process. And, you know, I feel that we, we need to sample, you know, as heavily as we can, but if we could get maybe some technicians in there to help out, you know. We, yeah, Mr. Mackey, we've, we've discussed that. We've already got one position with Chrissy coming on um, pretty quickly, hopefully through a deco. And we've, we've discussed a number of technicians to add in the region. Um, we've got great staff that are willing to, to come around from other parts of the state and assist as well. Um, and, you know, we're right there at Murray State University. We have students that we can help. So we're, you know, you know we'll be pulling from everywhere and anywhere we can to help with this. And yeah, getting a, getting enough people hands on deck to, to keep this rolling. And I'll also point out, so it's just as important for us to continue our monitoring statewide, not just in this area. So, yep. you know, yeah, we'll, we'll be detailing some folks for a short stint to help us, but they all have their other job duties and responsibilities. So they might be able to walk away for that from a short period, but then, you know, we're going to have to go back and do, you know, landowner visits back to communications, pulling CWD samples on other parts of the state. So uh, there are, there are other duties and we're cognizant of that. And uh, we we'll want to make sure that we still meet the mission of the agency across the board. Mr. Lillard, I think you had a question or comment. Yes. Um, with the, 
restriction on the feeding and baiting as it said the minerals i know like several places that i've hunted for years and we've had the same salt lick area or whatever and it's just all wallered out and they keep coming back there we probably haven't put anything there for a long time but i just how are we going to uh monitor that i guess if somebody has pre-existing uh mineral area or salt like that i mean i understand not put anything new in there but you know right. is there anything that we can do to there's really nothing we can do when it's kind of a natural or already fully established. What we would ask is that you just remove anything that's there. So if you still have the salt or that mineral block, go ahead and remove that. So you're not continuing to put more of that on the, on the landscape and the environment. Uh, but the, you know, there you can't dig it up. So we understand that. So it, it's going to be there. Uh, we just ask that you remove all of those substances and sources as soon as possible. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Brian Clark. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Gabe or Chris, uh, at this point, would you be able to describe to the hunters and our stakeholders what might be expected at one of those check stations? Some hunters may have trepidations about, okay, what am I, what am I going into? Just to give them a feel for if they've, if they've harvested a nice buck and they're going to a check station or if they've harvested does, what would they encounter in terms of staff and, and sample collection, that kind of thing? So, uh, a little bit of those details we're still working out, but we're looking at a couple staff per site. Uh, you know, there's going to be a balancing act. We want to try to get those samples from you. Uh, it might be you have a, a mature buck that, you know, you want to take and have taxidermy work on. We'll collaborate with you, work with you and your taxidermist uh, to try to get those samples. Uh, so we want to be as accommodating as, as much as we can, but also try to work with you in getting those samples. Um, but you know, we want it to be a, a friendly atmosphere. We will provide, we're planning on providing documents for education to you about what the disease looks like, the time frame, uh, how you can get your result. Uh, I will say that if we do detect the disease from a deer that we sample, we will call them directly as soon as we find out and have that one-on-one -on -one call with the, with the person who harvested that deer. Um, so we want this to be a, a positive experience, not positive CWD, but a positive experience for everybody. And, and so we want you to come and interact and, and uh, see us there and ask questions and, and be a good partner with us. That is an added benefit of this uh, surveillance, even though it's a little extra you know, distance uh, for some hunters on their way home is to swing by a check station. The, the hunters will get a, a test. And so they will know the outcome of that test. Uh, if it's positive, they'll be contacted. If not, uh, the results, I assume, will probably be, will those be posted in my profile? So we'll have an online uh, where you can get on and, and check that, the exact details and what that looks like. We're still working through that, but there will be an online uh, testing portal where you'll be able to get that result. There's already an online link from last year's for people who did volunteer their heads because we had a freezer program last year um, and a few people did donate. And so you can look those up um, on the website. So if you go to the website under the freezer program, there's a CWD results lookup. So Dr. Casey brought up a good point. I would like to just reiterate this now for anybody who's watching or has a concern. Um, you know, we do have this active freezer, uh, freezer drop off program. Uh, if you would like to have your deer tested and want to help us now before we get to the early youth muzzle or early youth gun season in October, please, by all means, stop by one of those check stations, uh, do the, you know, follow the, the instructions and donate that deer. Uh, we have staff checking on them daily. Uh, we have one in every county in those five counties and anticipate trying to get more in the interim, uh, but it's a great opportunity. And then we will post the results online and those are those directions and information are all right there at those freezer locations. Other questions? So we all understand that these three amendments that they propose will be addressed at the September 15th special call meeting. So in about a week from now, we'll be looking at these, but they thought it was best if they presented these now to give commission members and the public some time to peruse these amendments that they propose to clear up this area of Kentucky's uh, problem. So uh, I, I applaud their efforts to present it to us now. So we've got a, a week to look at them so all the commissioners can, can see what they propose. But we'll be taking up all three of those amendments on September 15th. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Clark. Just also a point of clarification. I think Rich mentioned this and, and uh, also Gabe has outlined it, but 
I just wanted to clarify for, again, just to avoid any confusion, the uh, statute and regs that apply to the department uh, empower the commissioner to take emergency actions uh, pertaining to such things as hunting seasons and methods of take uh, and transportation in the interest of uh, protecting fish and wildlife resources. And so these measures that got, gave outlined as proposals to change the regulations uh, are enacted. That is, they are um, emergency uh, applied or activated currently. And what we're seeking the commission's approval here is to, to actually change the regulations. So these are codified, they're, they're sort of permanent for the foreseeable future um, in this surveillance zone. And then we would similarly if we have uh, cases that are detected around the border or inside Kentucky elsewhere, we would revisit this issue for those geographies later. Um, and Chris or Gabe, correct me if I misstated anything there, but we wanna make clear that those provisions will be applied effectively um, or effective immediately. And this is uh, to, to reinforce longer term these emergency measures in regulation. Thank you, Commissioner Clark, for that clarification. That 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 helps some too. Do you have any more questions at this time about these three amendments for Gabe? Thank you, Gabe. I, I, I think you've made it crystal clear. So I appreciate that. Now to Dr. Floyd. Dr. Floyd, you're in the midst of all this. You're living right in there with it. So I know that you did ask to make a few comments and and uh, what your future your future suggestions might be or some of your future concerns might be. So uh, why don't you, well, we'll give you a few minutes to do, do what you want to do here. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, this is my home turf. I was born in Fulton County. I grew up in Hickman County. I own a farm in Graves County. I live in Callaway County and I work in Marshall County. So these five counties have a lot to do with me. I'm all over the place with them. So. What I'd like to say is all of these counties are already zone one, so there's unlimited those, so we can't really increase the bag limit and have an impact because we already got it at max, okay? If you want to have an impact on the deer population we in a material fashion, you'll need to add an early modern gun season. Before we do that, before we even talk about doing that, in the spirit of transparency, I'd like to make a motion that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources survey our stakeholders who hunt deer in these five counties in the CWD surveillance zone. Um, we can get a hold of those hunters through uh, their hunt. If they buy deer tags there, if they've checked deer in at those uh, counties, my understanding from talking with uh, Deputy Commissioner Clark that that won't be a problem to get a hold of the stakeholders that that the majority of them that hunt deer there. But what I would like to do is make a motion that the, the, uh, the, our stakeholders who hunt deer in the five counties in the CWD surveillance zone uh, be surveyed to determine their willingness to harvest more deer in either September or October uh, to try to reduce the risk of CWD. It may be that they will harvest more with crossbows, but you know I know a lot of folks will wait to harvest does until after they have taken a buck. I would like to encourage folks to, um, to harvest their does early and try to lower the population and lower our risk for CWD coming into our state. But I'd like to make this motion also that we do that survey. I know that was kind of crazy, but, but you guys understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, I understand, Dr. Ford. Let me ask legal a question here. Uh, uh, Mr. Fields, are you with us? Mr. Fields, yes. there you are. Yes, I am. Mr. Fields, uh, Dr. Floyd has kind of said he'd like to make a motion I wonder if, since we have not, and I see Sarah there too, since we have not put down any action items today, a motion really would not be technically correct if I understand that correct, correctly from, from, since it's not listed in the agenda. But can he make the suggestion or the request of the department to maybe conduct that survey without asking for a second and a motion from the commission to, to do that? In other words, instead of him making a motion that needed to be second and voted on, can he merely make the request to the department to maybe start a survey or request a survey of hunters? The, the, in other words, the kind of the motion he made in the form of a request to the department. 
because I, I don't want to get outside of the boundaries of a special call meeting and we do not have down anything about making a motion today. Yeah, I, I don't believe we can take any action at, as the commission um, on this item right now, as you stated, mm -hmm. it's not listed as an action item. So it's not uh, specific to our agenda, but um, obviously the, the department can do whatever survey it, it needs to to get information to the commission for their decisions. So, Dr. Floyd, do you, do you understand that yes, sir. We, we're, I understand. we're limited by the fact that it's a special call meeting and we have to follow exactly what's on the agenda? So I, I believe if you will, will, will ask the department and they can honor the request of seeing if they can conduct some kind of survey, they could be, get that going now. If not, that motion will probably need to be presented when we can put it in an action item, if you know what I mean. I, I, yeah. I, I, that is just fine with me. I just want to make sure our dinner, our deer hunters are involved here. Well, and, I, 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 boy, I, I think that's noted by all the other commission members who probably are somewhat sympathetic with the fact that uh, this is in your district and uh, you're going to have a lot of comments about that. It's the same that happens to Paul when, when, when elk questions come up and uh, the guys on the Ohio River when catfish issues come up. Those guys are deluged with questions. So I'd say you're going to get a lot of phone calls concerning what's going on in those five counties. So well, I think we're already sympathizing with the fact that you'll have that. And we know you're passionate about trying to get something done about that. But if you will honor the fact that you're, you're kind of making a request of the department to do that instead of a vote at this time. I'm, uh, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Also, I another, another I point. I'll satisfy your request. That's fine with me. Also, another point, Murray State has a good many wildlife biology and pre-vet students. I'm already a volunteer faculty at pre-vet, at the pre-vet program, so I know those guys. I feel certain that they would be delighted to help with this endeavor. Well, I wonder if you could maybe uh, supply that. There, there's Dr. Casey raising her hand. If we could get you and Dr. Casey on the same page and maybe she could. I'm already in touch with, so Dr. Andrea Duroc is a wildlife disease biologist there. And we do a, a necropsy lab. And I work with Bretha in their veterinary center, which is a lot of their pre-vet students. Um, so there's already um, a training. We were planning on doing a training and getting some, like the Wildlife Society student chapter out there involved and getting them trained up. Um, so that was that was pre pre this detection. We uh, we do it every fall. We do like a necropsy class and go over wildlife diseases with them. So they already have a training. Um, so we'll we'll keep working with them on that and getting those students involved. That's yeah, wonderful. I, I think that I think that goes back to Mr. Mackey's request. If we can get some people involved over there, other than pulling people out of an area. So maybe it, that kind of answers his question about, can we get somebody over there? So it looks like you've got contacts with people that are willing to jump on board with that too, to kind of answer his request of, uh, can we get, get some help over there? I will say that we, we do work with both Murray and Eastern Wildlife Society for collecting samples. We've done that for a long time. Um, we're going to call them even more now, but it is an effort that we have done. I mean, Many of our staff within the wildlife and fisheries divisions worked out as college students. I know I did when, when I was at Eastern. So uh, it's kind of an upbringing, a formal process when you're going through school here in Kentucky to help with CWD check stations and CWD collections. Other questions about these amendments for Gabe? Is there anything else, Gabe, that you need to interject at this point about our CWD uh, I don't think so. I think the, the last thing I would say is that if you have questions or concerns or, or somebody reaches out to you and you don't know the answer, please, by all means, share, share my phone number, share my contact with them. I'd be glad to do the best that I can to answer and hear their, their issues. Um, you know, this is, this is a big endeavor. Some of these things are, are kind of tough for some of our folks, and I understand that, and we're all listening. I know Chris and, and Dr. Casey all feel that way as well, so uh, we're, we're here to listen. We're here to work with our, with our uh, hunters and our landowners across the state and uh, be glad to chat with them, explain them. Our website is a fantastic resource. We will be putting more information on there in the coming days as we develop more. Um, so I encourage people to go visit that and see that to, to learn more about chronic waste and disease. Thank you, Gabe. I, I, I think this meeting has really been worth it to the public to to see that there is indeed a coordinated effort between the state of Tennessee, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, agriculture, both the state uh, veterinarian and our veterinarian, 
the commission, the commissioner's office. I think this shows a concerted effort on all those parts to work together toward the cause of, uh, of dealing with CWD in the state. So for sure, this meeting has been well worth it. Um, if there's no other business concerning CWD at this time, I, I want to entertain the, the fact that we need to go into executive session for a few minutes. So prior to entering that, I want to read a statement. All I'm meetings honored. of a court. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to reiterate. Uh, I don't think I mentioned the way that people can provide public comments if they have them earlier. I was going to so, do that at the end, but you go ahead okay. and you take care of one of my, my things to do at the end of the meeting. Go ahead. And Fantastic. Get we may have some. We may have some folks that tune out because of the, the transition from uh, executive okay. session to, to adjournment. So it might be good okay. to go ahead and do it. Uh, public comments will be accepted from now until 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Tuesday, September the 14th. And that's next Tuesday. And that's preceding, uh, just interject there, preceding the tentatively uh, scheduled next special call meeting, which would be at 10 a.m. on uh, Wednesday the 15th. So that's next Wednesday. Those wishing to comment about a topic discussed today, that would be these proposed um, regulation amendments, may email their comments with commission meeting in the the email subject line to fw.publicaffairs at ky.gov. Again, public comments will be accepted from now until 5 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, September 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And it was probably wise to do that before we break the executive session because we may have lost some people when we come back into general session. So thank you for doing that ahead for me. There's, if there's no other discussions about CWD, I, I'm, I will read this prior to entering the of the session. All meetings of the quorum of the members of any public agency at which any public business is discussed or at which any action is taken by the agency shall be public meetings, open to the public at all times except, except for specific items listed in KRS 61810. The commission has business today that will require entering into closed session. KRS 61815 requires notice of the general nature of the business to be discussed in the closed session, the reason for the closed session, and the provision of KRS 61810 that authorizes it to be publicly announced prior to entering closed session for most meeting exceptions. Today's closed session is to discuss pending litigation involving the commission. Closed session for litigation matters are not subject to the requirements of KRS 61815, However, in the interest of transparency, we shall provide that information. In today's session, we'll be discussing the litigation between the Commission and Tourism, Arts and Heritage and Finance Administration Cabinets. The session will be closed to protect the Commission's litigation interest. The closed session is authorized by KRS 61810 under Section 1C. This section permits closed session for discussion of proposed or pending litigation against or on behalf of a public agency. No final action will be taken in this session and no other business will be discussed other than what I just described. During the closed session, necessary members of staff and potential counsel will be present to advise the commission and make presentations regarding the topics that I just discussed. With that being said, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. My motion. motion is made by Ralph Swallows and seconded by Doug Morgan, Doug, did you second that? Seconded by Doug Morgan. Is there any discussion about going into closed session? If there's no discussion, I'll ask for you to raise your hand. If you are in favor of going into closed session, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carries. So we'll go into closed session. For those watching the public, we should be back in about 15 minutes into general session for just a few minutes. So gentlemen, we'll go to closed session. Thank you for your time.
back. Welcome back to general session. We have just come out of executive session. We knew it wouldn't take very long. We just got a legal update, uh, some some kind of good news. So we we have dispensed with the executive session. Uh, no votes are needed. It was a simply an update from legal counsel. Um, I want to remind everybody that the next special call commission meeting is going to be on September 15th. That's short notice, although we're in hopes that Tennessee will be able to update the commission and the department on what's happening uh, on uh, or at the Tennessee line there. And it will also be a time for us to uh, address motions concerning these three amendments that they have brought to us. The other next scheduled quarterly commission meeting is on December the 3rd. That will be the, the regularly scheduled quarterly session. So we hope to see everybody back at 10 o'clock, or it's tentatively, is that right, Commissioner? Tentatively at 10 o'clock, September the 15th, we will have another kind of update on CWD, both in Tennessee, what they're finding, and uh, address these amendments that have been brought to us. But that will give everybody time to peruse them and, and hear from their constituents. So uh, if there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to uh, adjourn our meeting. Josh Levin makes a motion seconded by Paul Horn. Uh, is there any discussion concerning adjournment at this time? Once again, I wanna thank you all and the TAH for such short notice. Uh, this is an extremely important issue and I appreciate everybody being available to us and uh, and maybe we'll be able to have Brian Fisher back with us next time, although he's out of state at this time. So uh, all in favor of, of adjournment, please signify by raising your hand. No need for no votes, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen, and, and TAH for being here today. Thank you, everybody. Good to see everyone. You too, have a good weekend, guys. Great weekend. Thank you.